This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and today I'm going to return with you to the ancient city of Pergamum and we're going to begin at the monumental gate of Humanes. Then I'm going to walk into the lower marketplace and then we're going to walk up the ancient Andesite road which leads to the middle district of ancient Pergamum. It's going to be wonderful and you're going to see that ancient site in the eyes of the first gospel preachers who came there. But please order the entire series. It's 10 parts called Take a Tour with Rick to Pergamum. Please come with me. Many people want me to take them on a tour and I can't, so I brought the tour to you so you can go there with me in this series. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is based on the city of Pergamum. It's called No Room for Compromise, Christ message to today's church. The believers in Pergamum, as you will see in all these programs, were really under pressure to conform to the spirit of the age. That's what we're facing today. But Christ told them not to compromise, and today he's still telling us there's no room for compromise. My friend, this book will really empower you for the things that you're facing today, and I want you to have it. But hey, it's going to be good today. We're going to go to Pergamum and step by step, we're going to see what the first gospel preachers saw when they first arrived in the city of Pergamum. But hey, all of these things can be ordered by going online or by giving us a call right now. And when you reach out to us, please let us know how to pray because we're praying people. And the Bible tells us in Jeremiah 33, 3, that if we'll call out to God in faith, he'll hear us, he'll answer us, and he'll show us great and mighty things. And as soon as we hear what you need, we're going to cry out with you in faith. God's going to hear, he's going to answer, and he's going to move mightily in your life. But right now, let's get started in Pergamum. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. This is Rick Renner, and I'm giving you a tour of the ancient site of Pergamum, but I'm in a village which is called Bergama. Actually, Bergama is a pretty nice Turkish town, but the area that I'm in is a village that is constructed on top of the ruins of the monumental gate of King Humanes of Pergamum. And I'm sure that when King Humanes built this gate, he never dreamed that a village would be built on top of it. In fact, this area is so abandoned, we had to walk between the sheep and the chickens to get to this spot. Now, the reason I'm taking you on this tour is because I wanna show you sites you'll never be permitted to see if you ever come to the city of Pergamum. These sites are 99% restricted to the general public, and the only reason we're here is because we have the express approval of the museum director of Bergama, Pergamum. And here we are. But these really were the gates of Humanes. And I'm certain that when he built these gates, he intended to build a structure so monumental that it would stand forever in his honor. The gates were made of andesite stone and they're still here, but they're scattered all over the place among all kinds of rubbish and chickens and dogs and goats. It's quite amazing. I think the King Eumenes would be quite disappointed if he saw what his gate looked like today. But you know, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Everything built with human hands eventually falls into deterioration. The only thing that survives is what is done spiritually for the kingdom of God. That's why we really need to think about what we're doing with our lives. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, Peter wisely said, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And when I see sites like this, it really makes me reassess my life. What am I building? Am I investing in something that's going to last forever? 
or I'm investing my life in things which eventually are going to pass away. These gates eventually passed away. And the truth is only things done for the kingdom of God last forever. So how we use our money, how we develop relationships, who we preach to, who we talk to, who we touch with our lives, those are the things that really last forever. Everything material eventually collapses and falls into deterioration, just like the great illustrious gates of King Humanus of Pergamum. This is all that remains of two massive towers, which were the primary entrance to the upper part of Pergamum. There was a gate that led up through the middle between the two towers, and that was the way a visitor had to enter this upper part of the city. And from here, fortress walls encircled the entire city of Pergamum to protect it. But as the first gospel preachers arrived here, they would have looked up to the peak of the hill and seen gleaming white structures, which really were constructed to be a giant altar on which various sacrifices were offered to the pagan gods. But Pergamon was divided into three sections, lower, middle, and upper. The lower district was entered through this gate, the Gate of Humanes, a monumental gate with three watchtowers built by King Humanes of Pergamon. It had an outer and inner entrance, and it was connected to a fortification wall that encircled the entire exterior of the city. But once through the gate, a visitor suddenly found himself standing on a stone-paved ancient road that twisted and turned through all three districts of Pergamum as it led upwards to the city's Acropolis. And over the centuries, it is amazing the historical figures that traveled this road as they entered Pergamum. That includes Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and Augustus, as well as countless educators, philosophers, politicians, and historians. No bathhouse ruins in this area of the lower district have ever been excavated to date, but we can be pretty sure that one was located somewhere near the Gate of Humanes during the first century. But as the winding street snaked upwards through each quarter of the city that covered the slopes of the mountain, its width varied depending on the severity of the twists in the road. And on either side of the street were a wide variety of shops that stood behind the magnificent andesite columns lining either side of the road. But regardless of what those first gospel preachers saw when they entered this section of the city, its opulence was a shadow compared to what they were going to see at the peak of the mountain. Deep parallel ruts ran up and down the entire length of the road from the Gate of Humanes to the citadel on top of the mountain, evidence of chariots that had carried passengers up and down the street to all three districts of the city for hundreds and hundreds of years. Just a few steps from the illustrious Gate of Humanes, after passing several administrative buildings, the first gospel preachers would have arrived here in the lower market of Pergamum. The lower market in Pergamum wasn't as large or as famous as the central marketplace in Ephesus. Its size was approximately 110 feet by 210 feet. The sides were lined with more than 100 shops under the roofs of elegant, two-story colonnades lined with Doric columns and all types of goods, dairy products, meat, vegetables, olives, oil, and even some luxury items could be purchased here. And the courtyard literally overflowed with statues of Greek heroes, city fathers, poets, philosophers, doctors, teachers, emperors, and gods, each chiseled so perfectly and painted so accurately that they almost appeared to be real living human beings. But in the first century, it was considered socially unacceptable for a woman to shop in a public marketplace. So if the first gospel preachers came here into this market and saw a woman 
it was likely that she was a prostitute. Back in those days, prostitution didn't carry the same stigma that it has today. Prostitutes abounded in the Roman world. There were actually bakery prostitutes. While you were at the bakery waiting for your bread, there was a side room where you could go to entertain yourself with prostitution. Prostitution was everywhere in the Roman Empire. You could find it in the markets. You can find it in the bathhouses. In fact, the word fornix is the Latin word for the arches. This is connected to the word fornication. How does the word arches connect to fornication? Well, I'll tell you. In the city of Rome was the massive Roman Colosseum, where people came to see all kinds of games. And during the intermission, the men would go out to go to the bathroom. And on their way back to their seats, very often they would stop fornix under the arches, where they would rendezvous with a prostitution. So the word fornication, taken from the word fornix, really means to do it under the arches, and it describes loose, casual, uncommitted sex. It is absolutely forbidden by God. In the first century world, this was so common, it would be like men going out to take a smoke during the intermission between the games. That is how decadent Greek and Roman society was. Roman society was so decadent that a man's sexual encounter with a prostitute during intermission at the games or maybe in the corner of the market wasn't even considered morally wrong or unusual. And as in all large Roman cities, Pergamum had a large prostitution business to provide services both to the locals and to thousands of visitors who came to conduct business in the city. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and sex, was also the patron goddess of prostitutes, and in the cult of Aphrodite, the priestesses of this goddess were temple prostitutes. Their role was to have sexual relations with cult worshipers in a perverse form of service to the goddess Aphrodite. This explains why Paul wrote to the Corinthians, and in 1 Corinthians 6, 15 to 18 said, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined unto a harlot is one body? For two saith he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. The word fornication in Greek describes any kind of sexual relations outside of the confines of marriage between a man and a woman. But you have to understand that that word fornication in Latin is fornix. It really means flee sex under the arches. In other words, run from loose, casual, uncommitted sex. This is the command of God. As you're listening to me, you may think, wow, they were really decadent. Well, in the first century, they had to go to the market, or they had to go to the brothel, or they had to go to the bakery, or they had to go to the stadium to find sex like I'm describing. But today's world really is much more decadent. You don't even have to leave your home to imbibe yourself on wrong images. All you have to do is turn on your phone, look at the internet, or watch movies, my friends, decadence abounds more today than ever before. And if the command to flee from idolatry was true in the first century, how much more true is it today when our young people, even our children, are being inundated with images? And we have a God-given responsibility to guard our own mind and our own eyes and the minds and eyes of our children and our grandchildren. The command to flee fornication is as relevant today as ever before. And the business of selling sex wasn't reserved only for females. In pagan environments, homosexuality abounded, and male prostitutes were also kept busy serving customers. When the church was being established in the first century in many, many pagan cities, people were being delivered from these dark, dark backgrounds. And in Corinth, many people were being delivered from all kinds of sexual addictions. In fact, we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, 
nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but now you're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified by the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. But notice in this verse, he mentions fornicators, those who are casually committing sex with those of the same sex or any sex outside of marriage. But he also mentions the effeminate. And when you read this in Greek, this word effeminate describes the act of homosexuality. People were being saved out of every kind of sinful vice. They were being washed in the blood of Jesus, justified in the name of Jesus, sanctified by the Spirit of God. And after living such a dark life, they were finally finding themselves in the house of God. That was going to happen here in Pergamum too, because the gospel preachers had arrived to bring the light of the gospel. But in the marketplace, kiosks were set up to display goods such as cotton, wheat, and vegetables for potential buyers. And huge vases filled with wine were piled against one another in corners. Money changers traded money for people who came with foreign currency from other cities or countries. You have to understand, this was an international market. And to a visitor, it would have seemed as if all the nations of the world had converged in one place. Taking in a wide variety of skin colors and ethnic clothing, the gospel preachers would have heard an extraordinary mixture of languages as men conducted their daily business with each other in this marketplace. Today, as you walk through these ruins of the lower marketplace, you see many of the ruins which were made of andesite stone, including fallen columns. And it's interesting that in one corner of this marketplace, there's a big pile of cannonballs that had been launched against this city over thousands of years. They kept them and they piled them up in one big pile of the market. It's very interesting to see. And in the Museum of Pergamum, which today is called the Bergamot Museum, are many of the statues which once were erected in this magnificent market. Starting from the lower marketplace, the first gospel preachers would have come up this snaking, winding road that went all the way to the top of Pergamum. And as they came up this ancient road, they would have seen the chariot tracks, which had already been there for hundreds of years. Over the centuries, famous historical figures entered Pergamum on this very same street. I'm talking about people like Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, Augustus, even Trajan came to the city of Pergamum on this very road. But as the gospel preachers ascended this road, it got steeper and steeper and steeper. You can see behind me the retaining wall for this very, very steep road. And as they walked up this road to their left, they passed shop after shop after shop. The lower marketplace is where people bought more common goods. But the top of this city was the peak of luxury. And as the first gospel preachers walked up this road, they would have been taken back by the luxury items they saw in these shops. These shops were reserved for the wealthy, and the wealthy lived in Middle Pergamum and the Upper District. So the higher you went on this road, the items in the shop became more luxurious and more expensive. The first gospel preachers had no choice except to keep walking up this road, which is very steep. In fact, from where I am, looking beyond the camera, I can see the entire valley below. I can't imagine chariots being pulled by horses coming up this steep, very narrow road. But eventually, the gospel preachers would have seen these 40 steps which led up to a huge house that belonged to a local councilman whose name was Adelus. Let's go there. When people walked up those 40 steps to see the house of Adelus, they would have been stunned because it was a massive two-story house with all kinds of covered colonnades, 
The columns were just magnificent. And of course, like everyone else, the entire place was built of andesite stone. It had fountains, it had a well, multiple rooms, and from this place, Atlas had the best view because from here, there's a complete panoramic view of the valley below. When Atlas lived here, he could see mountains, he could see rivers, he could see pagan temples below him. He must have loved this location. But Atlas played a very significant role in the history of the lower district of Pergamum. The sheer size of his home revealed that this councilman really enjoyed entertaining. It had a banquet room, a living room, multiple sleeping quarters, an indoor bathroom, and two pools, one in its courtyard and the other near its eastern colonnade. The floors were decorated with marvelous mosaics, and the interior walls were covered with phenomenal frescoes. But walking further up the road, eventually the gospel preachers passed a variety of at least 30 more shops that lined the road on each side. And the further they walked up that road toward the middle district, the items in the shops became more rare and more expensive. Pergamum was possibly the darkest pagan city in the first century when gospel preachers first arrived there. But with the power of the Holy Spirit, they penetrated that spiritual darkness, and the church was born in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the series, Take a Tour with Rick, Pergamum, Rick Renner walks you through the entire site of Pergamum with permission from local authorities. Every door was open to Rick and his film crew to give you the most in-depth and all-inclusive tour of this once formidable city. This is truly a one-of-a-kind tour of Pergamum, and you'll join Rick as he walks you step-by-step step through each site and teaches you all along the way. Rick says, if the Christians in Pergamum could stay true to their faith in the darkness they lived in, then we can do it too. This 10-part documentary-style series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. We're also offering the book, No Room for Compromise, a full-color, beautifully illustrated, hardbound book that will captivate you and your family for years to come. On every page, Rick reveals the realities that early believers faced as the church began to flourish in a dark pagan world with unsurpassed detail, fascinating insights, and historical context. You'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of Scripture and how you should interpret it for today. No Room for Compromise is available for just $80. Don't miss this special offer. The illuminating series, Take a Tour with Rick, Pergamum, and the book, No Room for Compromise. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner, and today I'm standing in the big studio in our new building in Moscow. You helped us build this building. Behind me is the big fireplace. It's covered. That's really the focus of the new studio. There's going to be library shelves and so many wonderful things. And I'm going to be sitting right here teaching the Bible verse by verse, diving into the Greek New Testament to bring teaching that people can trust to the ends of the world. And when I tell you the ends of the world, I really mean that. People are reaching out to us from the farthest ends of the world saying thank you for bringing this teaching right to where we are. And my friends, you're a big part of this because you're a partner. You helped build this building and I want to say thank you to you. I've told you before, it's not about buildings. You just have to have the space so you can create programming. And in just a few weeks, my team is going to move into the second floor of this building while they continue to finish the first floor of the building. It's pretty exciting. But thank you so much for helping us. We really do what we say we're going to do. So here it is. And at the same time, we've been retiring the debt on the big Tulsa facility. That facility is so wonderful. And from that office in Tulsa, we are ministering to the needs of our partners. Partner ministry is not secondary to us. It is first place. We really mean it when we call people partners. And in that Tulsa facility, we're taking calls, making calls, touching lives, and strengthening people who need to be strengthened. That's God's mandate to us to strengthen those that are weak and those who need to be stronger. And we're reaching out by faith 
and through various means to touch people. And what a pleasure it is. It's really an honor to have partners, and that means you. Thank you for being a partner. And right now, we're paying off that Tulsa facility, and a lot of it has already been paid off. That's miraculous. But it's been possible because of the grace of God, the favor of God, and because of your faithful and generous giving. And I want to say thank you on behalf of me and Denise and our sons, our family, and our ministry team for the way that you've joined hands with us to help retire the debt on that building. My friends, when that building is paid off, it will suddenly release a flood of finances so we can take the teaching of the Bible even further to the ends of the earth. And that's God's call to us. Proverbs 10, 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. And that's our task, to feed many the Word of God. And today I want to thank you for what you've done to help us build this facility and to pay off the Tulsa building. And together, we can get this done. Well, today I took you to the monumental gate of Humanes. It is amazing. Then I took you into the lower marketplace and began the walk up the very steep ascending Andesite Road, which leads to the middle district of Pergamum. But when we come back tomorrow, I'm going to take you to the gymnasium. I'm going to take you to the palestra, to the bathhouses of that region. I'm going to show you the Temple of Hera and the Civic Hall. It is so amazing what we're going to see tomorrow. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to see what the gospel preachers faced when they first came to Pergamum to preach the gospel. If they could preach... And if they could walk in faith and in the power of God in that dark environment, then you can do it too. And that is why I want you to have the whole series, which is called Take a Tour with Rick Pergamum. My friends, it is so rich. It'll feed your spirit and it will feed your mind and really cause the New Testament to come alive for you. And that is also why I want you to order my book, which is called No Room for Compromise. Christ's message to today's church, which really is based on what Jesus had to say to the church of Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2. And every page of this book is full color. All kinds of photos and illustrations and art. It will just make history come alive for you so that you can understand what the believers were facing in the first century. And again, if they could do it, my friends, you can do it victoriously as well. But you can order all these things by going online or by giving us a call right now. And please let us know how to pray for you. And Father, I pray right now for the power of God to erupt from my precious friend to dominate the darkness that they're dealing with. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'll see you tomorrow. It's going to be good. But remember, Ecclesiastes 8.4, it says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Thank you for watching this broadcast. For more information on product resources or to learn how you can partner with this ministry, please connect with us at renner.org. Also, please be sure to visit us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.